This 10th year of Daily Tech News Show is made possible by you, the listener. Thanks to all of you, including Steve Iadarola, Jeffrey Zilks, and Tony Glass. Coming up on DTNS, Microsoft raises its AI game. The ethics of large language models begin to impact real life. And is this the end of electric vehicle range anxiety? It should be, but it probably won't be. This is the Daily Tech News for Thursday, March 2nd, 2023 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. And from that D.C. area, your boy, Chris Ashley. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. Ah, it's good to have everybody in the house. Thanks for joining us. Uh, we, we have got a world of tech news to keep you the smartest person in the room. Let's start with the quick hits. Reuters sources say that Microsoft's offer of a 10-year licensing deal to not only Nintendo, but also NVIDIA, and especially to Sony, is likely to sway EU regulators to approve its proposed acquisition of Activision Blizzard. The EU has just extended its deadline for its decision to April 25th. Microsoft still needs to persuade regulators in the UK and also the US to approve the deal. Mm, so you're saying there's a chance. <laughs> Uh, PCI Express 5.0 is supported by newer motherboards. All PCs built around AMD's Ryzen 7000 series chips and some PCs using Intel's 12th or 13th generation CPUs support graphics cards and SSDs that use PCI Express 5.0. But that's only half the battle. You need the devices that support the faster interface too. And the first wave of drives are beginning to hit store shelves. The PCIe 5.0 SSD Gigabyte Aorus Gen 5 10,000 and Micro Center exclusive Inland TD510 both promise those high speeds, peak read speeds of up to 10,000 megabytes per second, up from 7450 per second in 4.0. Uh, but cost is a little bit of a factor. Ars Technica says the two terabyte versions are more than twice the price of equivalent PCI 4.0 versions, and the drive's heat sinks are, in Ars Technica's words, ridiculous, very large. <laughs> I think they really did say that. They did. Uh, they may not even fit in some installations, so you might want to check that. The price will come down, as will the operating temp, which will make the heat sinks a little smaller. But uh, for now, be warned. Snapchat rolled out the ability to pause snap streaks where you can send a snap to a friend once every 24 hours. All users can restore one snap streak for free, but you can also buy more streak restores for 99 cents in the U.S. The company also plans to roll out the feature as part of its Snapchat Plus subscription. It's not really a streak, though. <laughs> it, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. If Antarctica can get its act together, Google and Meta may soon have the distinction of being investigated for antitrust on every continent. Uh, <laughs> regulators from Kenya, Egypt, Mauritius, Nigeria, South Africa, Morocco, Gambia, and Zambia have set up a working group last month and now plan to investigate those companies and a few others. The Common Markets of Eastern and Southern Africa, or COMESA, Competition Commission, represents 21 other countries, and it is also joining this effort. Members of the group are planning joint investigations in e-commerce, aggregator services, e-hailing and delivery services, digital advertising, fintech, and app stores. So, the usual. Garmin just uh, launched its Forerunner 265 and Forerunner 965 smartwatches with OLED screens. The mid-range watches are marketed towards outdoor users who usually want readability and battery life, two things that OLED is not particularly good at. The Forerunner 25 5S, for example, got more than 20 days on a charge using a memory in Pixel or MIP display. OLEDs are easier to read indoors and during cloudy conditions. And The Verge's Victoria Song notes that Garmin has been moving into more lifestyle features over the past couple of years. That's the quick hits. All right. People have been making big, say, rude stuff, so Microsoft restricted it, clamped down to get it to stop doing that. Uh, but that made it refuse to answer a lot of innocent questions that, that people needed to get answered. So Microsoft is dialing back those restrictions. But now Microsoft now lets you choose what kind of personality you want the Bing chatbot to have. You can select from three different tones, creative, balanced, and precise. The creative tone will include original and imaginative responses. The precise tone gives you factual and concise answers. And the balanced tone is somewhere in between. 
Yeah, you can think of the uh, precise tone as as me, uh, the creative tone as Sarah, and the balanced tone as Chris. <laughs> there it is. Uh, Microsoft didn't clarify this, but it sounds to me like uh, a, a setting in the large language models called temperature is different for these different tones. Temperature changes how the models pick the words. Uh, I won't go too far into it, but a quick explanation. If the model always picks what it thinks the most likely next word is based on its training, it can sound very dry. It could sound very precise. Uh, whereas making it occasionally pick the second or third most likely word gives it a more conversational tone, which to me could be that creative setting there. So I, what do you all think of, 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 of Bing's triangulation here, I, uh, I think trying to find the right tone? Definitely a smart move um, if you want to be able to grab the most amount of people. Um, when I when I read this over, and I kind of think of two things. One is you're basically choosing which version of data you want. Do you want data with the chip or do you want data without the chip? And then mm -hmm. on top of that, it's like, you know, it's almost like the description of the Matrix when they finally revealed it, right? When it was too perfect, nobody liked it. And when it was you know, not perfect enough. Nobody could accept it. It had to have the the variations in between. And it sounds like it, it's really falling along the same lines. It's like, here, pick a different word or a third word as opposed to the one that always comes up in that type of response. Yeah, so really I kind of like the idea of it. Well, and something that we're always talking about on the show is like, okay, so if not everybody gets the same results, you know, how does this help what you might be doing for yourself? Maybe I want to, uh, you know, write some fiction. So temperature actually makes a lot of sense. I probably want it to be a little bit more creative. If I'm doing something for DTNS, I probably want it to be more precise. Yeah, yeah. As long as you're using the tools in a way that makes sense to you. And, you know, we're at, you know, the, the beginning stages of a lot of people trying to do that. I don't think any of this is, you know, better or worse. Um, you know, if you were trying to say something as fact that was a little bit more creative, well, that's where we get into issues. Um, and Microsoft, um, as well as other chat bot makers, have, have learned these hard lessons pretty early on. One of the things they're trying to do is stop people from misusing it uh, and making it say rude and unusual things. Uh, right. I'm guessing they feel comfortable enough that that creative tone has a better safety net uh, than it did before. But I also think giving people three tones and making the default balanced lets them make most of the users have a higher safety net. And then if you change it to creative, they can kind of give you a warning of like, hey, it might have a few more unexpected responses, just so you know. Uh, and 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 that way, when if it does go off the rails a little more, it's like, hey, we, we told you you were using the creative setting. If you don't like that, maybe switch back to balanced or precise. Right. That's an interesting way of doing it. I wonder if there's any chance of this having the ability to combat like a, a confirmation bias. Just because, mm. I, if it can be expanded along those lines, so you know, just the fact that it's not picking what the you know what the top answer would be, but you know, three variations of it. You wonder if that can then be expanded into not showing you always yeah. the information that you want to hear, but the information that is you should hear. Correct. It's it's yeah. it's more about picking word choice and like yeah. synonyms and things than it is facts. But that's an interesting thought of whether yeah. there's there's some spin off there that they could they could apply that to. Uh, yeah. Right. Uh, speaking of, of, of Microsoft's tech chops, uh, Bing is using tech from OpenAI that Microsoft is adapting, but Microsoft also has its own development of these kinds of smart models. Uh, Microsoft scientists published a paper about Cosmos One, a multimodal large language model, or MLLM, designed to analyze images and answer questions about them, so it can tell what it's looking at, basically. The system writes captions for images, reads text from images, can answer questions about them, like I just said. Scientists say that multimodal Modal systems are a necessity to achieve artificial general intelligence. Uh, a lot of folks in the field think multimodal is going to be a much bigger deal than large language models are right now. Microsoft plans to make Cosmos One available to developers, but no details on that yet. Uh, is this the next thing to to freak out about? <laughs> is, yes. Is that, you know <laughs> that 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 these these models can look at a picture and go like, oh yeah, that's that's a boy carrying a balloon or whatever. Absolutely. Um, I mean, I, like, is it though? Like, does that frighten you? 
I, I wouldn't say frightened, but I'm all I'm frightened by all of this, to be honest with you. You know, yeah, I've, well, I've watched enough yeah. sci-fi, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> but no, I, I you know I never even thought about this angle until I actually read this article, and then after I read it, I was like, oh wow, yeah, that makes perfect sense. The, the more inputs you have, the, the tighter your responses are, the the more valid the responses probably can be. So really interesting. But, you know, I always think about the bad stuff people can do with this, but I, I don't want to think about this in, in that regard right now. Right, right now, it, it sounds really cool, but it sounds super powerful at that point. And the fact that they said, you know, this this model can replace more regular um, functions in, in, mm-hmm. in everyday life is like, ooh. You know? Well, Im- imagine when you're teaching someone something, how often you say, look at this, and yeah. if you can have a model that can do that and understands what what to show you what the image is i think that's yeah. that's fascinating uh the the one of the places that chris is pointing us to is the ethics debate around ai right the the idea that it can be used for ill and what are the safeguards we're going to put on it uh as we let more and more people use it uh open ai for example is launching apis so things that developers can use to access open ai technology uh not only for chat gpt but also the whisper speech to text model to get ahead of ethics questions open ai is clarifying that users of the APIs have always and will continue to own the input and output of the models. So if the output is to you, you own that output, not OpenAI. There's a 30-day retention period limit for API users. Uh, so they, they shouldn't be keeping user input from their use of the API. It could even be shorter depending on the case. OpenAI says it will not use any data submitted through its API for training or other service improvements unless the customer or the organization specifically opts in to do so they will they will not use it unless the customer says i would like you to use it for this yeah and in another example of proactive machine intelligence policy shifts comes from apple it has delayed approval of an update to email app blue mail the blue mail update added an embedded version of chat gpt trained on contents in the user's email and calendar events the idea is to help draft emails and calendar invites to the user's own style. Yeah, so Blue Mail says Apple reviewers told them to either raise the age appropriate designation to 17 or older or add content filters. But Blue Mail disputes this need, saying that it has content filtering set to apply for users four years old and older already. Now, Apple told the Wall Street Journal it's investigating the issue, so, you know, we'll see what comes of that. But it's worth noting that Apple has had issues with the Blue Mail app before and its parent company, Blix. In 2019, you might recall that Blue Mail was removed from the App Store over a security concern related to Blix's patent on signing in without giving up personal information. That issue took a few months to resolve. They did it. But now they're kind of back in the news. So what do we think here? Might be a beef, might be a long going beef, or is Apple just doing that thing where they change a policy by applying it to one app first, (laughs) many apps later? So I read through this a bit and I, you know, I love Julius choosing the little guy against the big guy. You know, I just want to blame all the big folks, but I don't know if blue mail really has a leg to stand on in this one because the, the big thing that they pointed out was like, look, all any it, uh, tool or app that has the ability to show minors, ex, uh, you know, explicit content, you got to get the rating. And so, if you're adding Chat GPT, which you know can potentially search can, the internet, can add stuff, adult content quite easily. Yeah. Yeah. What are you saying? <laughs> you know, well, but like, the, what Blue Bale's saying is, we put a filter on to stop it from doing the adult content. Yeah, but. You know how how much can they guarantee that their filter is not going to inadvertently pull something anyway? I mean, this sounds sort of semantic to me. Apple saying, uh, "Put a filter on in this way," and Blue May is like, "Well, we did, just not in the exact way that you were asking us for, but we're not doing anything wrong." And now yeah. Apple's like, "Hmm, let's go back to the well and think about this a little bit." I, I feel like there's more to the story, right? Yeah. Either either the app reviewer missed it that there was the, the, the filter on there. Cause I think Apple's just asking simply like put in an acceptable filter or 
I just said acceptable filter. Maybe Blue <laughs> Mail put a filter on that Apple's like, we know that one doesn't work. There are better filters, like Chris was saying, like use use a filter that, that works better. But I, I don't think we have all the information. No. Meanwhile, Blix is going public with this, talking to, to everybody, like the Wall Street Journal, because yeah. they have beef. They definitely have beef with Apple. They've had it before. Yeah, but... You know, beef has to go both ways sometimes. You know, they can be, you know, screaming in the wind and Apple's <laughs> yep, like, yep. you know, got their hand up with their in their forehead and they're just swinging away. And just like, and yeah, look, no. Chris knows about beef. Check out Barbecue and Death. <laughs> That's <laughs> right. Beef, beef, it goes both ways, <laughs> period. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so I, I don't know. Honestly, I don't know what four year old is using email. And a calendaring No, that's just they're, they're doing it four years old and up so that so that people will so be it's like, not like a blanket like you thing. know yeah. we're we're filtering so good even a four-year-old should be able to use it not, <laughs> they're not saying they want four-year-olds to use the I, was, I was trying to think my daughter was on, i have a picture of my daughter on my desk typing in, on my keyboard when she was like two but i don't remember her setting an appointment for her next yeah, uh, I, I didn't get the sense they were marketing it to four-year-olds <laughs> i don't know i could be wrong though uh you know I, it's <laughs> It's quite possible. Uh, folks, if, if you know what's going on with Blue Mail for real or anything else, you just want to say hi, you want to get uh, some beef recipes, get in touch with us on the social networks at DTNS Show on Twitter, at Daily Tech News Show on TikTok, or DTNS Picks, DTNS P-I-X on Instagram. Oops, that's the wrong one. There we go. We have world's most famous Ford Lightning owner with us, Chris Ashley. Let's talk electric vehicles, shall we? We've talked about the EV company, VinFast, uh, on the show before, a Vietnamese company headquartered in Singapore. So worth noting that the company delivered its first cars, 45 of the VF8 City Edition, to customers in California. VinFast has 10 U.S. stores in the San Diego, Los Angeles, and Bay Area. But Ars Technica has a story. In fact, they republished a story from Inside Climate News that I think we really want Chris's opinion about. Uh, some research on electric vehicle range. Scientists at the University of Delaware published an article in the journal Energies called Influence of Battery Energy, Charging Power, and Charging Locations Upon EV's Ability to Meet Trip Needs. Basically, how does this stuff really affect range? Like, wh what are people worrying about versus what should they worry about? So they looked at 333 gas-powered vehicles over the course of a year in Atlanta and then modeled how well an EV would have met those drivers' needs if they'd been using that instead of the gas car. Yeah, and so they found that an EV with a 100-mile range could meet 100% of the driving needs of at least the driving 25% of the population. So 25% of the drivers could have made all their trips with something like a Nissan Leaf. Also charging wherever they normally parked. Maybe it was at home, maybe it was at work, maybe it was you know somewhere else that they knew that they could charge. So the other 75% would have needed to make a few changes to their driving habits to find charging stations, most likely during longer trips or to get a car with a bigger battery. Even when they looked at larger EVs, they found that most drivers would rarely, if ever, use the upper ends of their ranges. One of the contentions of the paper is that, financially, it would make more sense not to spend an extra $10,000 on a bigger car with a bigger battery, but just rent a car when you need to go on a longer trip. Chris, as a driver of a big, impressive EV truck, what do you think of this study? It's amazing. Uh, that a lot of the points that they're making, everyone who listens to this show that has heard me talk about it has heard those same exact points. You know, if you're going on a trip and you're so concerned with the range, go rent a car. Um, most of the times you're asking, people are asking questions about the capabilities of an EV that they don't even do with their regular car. So, you know, if you drive to work, Every day you take one vacation, you know, per year and you just grab to work and back. Then what the heck do you care how long, how long the vehicle goes unless you're driving like some 300 miles away for to go to work? Which I think, you know, most people don't have to worry about that. But it's that one use case where you're like, well, I can't. I can't use it for that. Yeah, what people, if, you know, what if, what, you know, I run out of battery on, you know, the, the open road. Now what? Yeah. The only 
the concern, and this is a slight concern that I think people should be aware of, right, is you you can get into habit of not charging a vehicle at night because by certainly you don't have to charge the vehicle every day. Um, and then if an emergency pops up where you're like, okay, I need to drive to grandma's house, which is, you know, two hours away, then you could run into the point where it's like, okay, I don't have enough charge currently. Um, but if you find a fast charger mm -hmm. and just go hit the fast charger, I mean, people aren't realizing that these fast chargers are literally charging these vehicles in like 30 minutes. Yeah. You know, we, we were talking offline before the show and Roger mentioned something that Todd net is also mentioning in our chat room. Uh, Todd net says I have an EV and I don't have rangs range anxiety. I have charging anxiety. Will the charger I need, you know, when I stop on the highway or park in the parking garage work, will it be full? Uh, yeah. is it the compatible one with my car? That kind of thing. Yeah. And that's probably a more of an issue right now is even when I went to ocean city over the summer, um, and even though I had more than enough charge to get to Ocean City, Maryland and back <laughs> on one charge, honestly, um, I wanted to charge before I got into Ocean City because I just wanted to be able to drive around. And, you know, it was my first long, it was the longest trip I had taken to date with the truck. And every place I stopped on the way up, the chargers were broken, every single one of them. So I just gave up and I said, I'll just drive into Ocean City. Now, on the other side of that, when I got to Ocean City, all the uh, pretty much all the chargers were working and there was thankfully there was one directly across the street from my hotel so i was able to park the car park park the truck you know check our things up and just plug in the truck overnight had a full charge in the morning so uh, but that that is correct there are a lot of people that are reporting issues with some of these not even with tesla doesn't have this issue but for whatever reason uh folks on the uh electrify america that they, they, they got to get their game together because a lot of their chargers are broken or some people have reported to where the chargers have destroyed their vehicles. Uh, so those things do exist. I'm not going to yeah, pretend yeah. like everything is perfect, but the, the stuff that people are worried about with range and that that's, that's not the thing you need to be concerned with. Range anxiety is a thing people who don't have EVs have. It sounds like. <laughs> yeah. I, I, the two questions I get every time is how far can you go? How long does it take to charge? First, first two questions right out of the mm -hmm. gate. And I'm like, and I, if I'm not busy, I'll tease them. I was like, how long does it take to charge your cell phone? You don't know, right? <laughs> well, you know, we had uh, at where I live, um, some friends with an EV uh, come to stay a couple of weekends ago. And they were like, do you have, like, do you have a fast charger? And I was like, no, but <laughs> I have a, you know, power <laughs> outlet. I have electricity. Yeah. yeah like how, like. How often do you need to like come and go? And they were like, well, not often, but like, oh my gosh, power outlet. But I was like, <laughs> you now charge you it have overnight. One, you like, have a you know, <laughs> it's like, I, I feel like there's sort of like this like ingrained nature of being like, well, we need to have the best chargers no. so we can it, be everywhere all the time. But like, let's think about what you're actually doing. Yeah. Exactly. It's, it's, it's actually the opposite of that. So when I go to the airport, um, they have the super slow charger, right? I mean, super slow. It doesn't matter. I'm gone for three days. If it takes my right. truck three days to charge, yes, doesn't matter. Yeah. Who cares? Man, yeah, most of the time, people are people. waking up with a quote unquote full tank. That's a Professor Kempton point that said that to Ars Technica. Like, you, yeah. you charge overnight, you wake up fully charged. You don't, well, you like, doesn't you, make a difference. Yeah, yeah. I'm sleeping. Uh, Last question on this. Uh, Ford told TechCrunch it's starting uh, restarting production of the Ford F-150 Lightning on March 13th uh, because it's reworking a battery issue that it discovered in February. Are you concerned about this at all as a Lightning owner? It's not supposed to affect you, but I'm just curious. So for me, um, I knew that I was buying the first line of the vehicle, and mm -hmm. I fully expected to be probably have to go through some growing pains. Now... I haven't had a lot of issues. I did take the truck in for its first issue um, that I've experienced, uh, which is a, uh, a sensor issue on my uh, my parking sensor. So it's something minor. It's not a big deal. I know how to park a truck. Um, but, you know, so while, yeah, if, obviously, if something goes wrong with my battery, it's a wrap, right? For But in the, in the end, I'm pretty comfortable with how Ford has been handling updates and been mm -hmm. handling... Uh, service and you know reaching out and when you know they they gave everybody like free chargers when they were no sorry they gave 
everybody like two hundred and fifty dollars worth of charging when they couldn't get the uh, charger shipped on time. Um, so uh, so far, you know, service has been good from Ford, and so I'm not overly concerned. I'd be bummed out if something happened to my battery, but I'm not overly yeah, yeah. concerned. Um, yeah, if it does seem like wrong. the pause was an abundance of caution, just because they found it a weird like result it. and they're just tracking that down. So yeah, hopefully that's the case. Well, um, we like to be as global as possible on the show. So let's check in with Dan Compost for some new tech news coming from CDMX. Hello, friends of DTNS. This week in NTX, we have a special interview with uh, Oscar Morales, co-founder of Sifty, and he's going to tell us a little bit about machine learning and how it can help international trade processes. Let's go with you, Oscar. In a nutshell, it is about reducing the time to process a merchandise that goes through customs either assigning a risk assessment or extracting data from a complicated document and then reshape it into what they need to fulfill a customs declaration. The idea here is to simplify customs processes for our customers that are customs brokers. And perhaps it's customs, 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 but it is important to know that everything that goes across the world, if you have buy anything uh, from, let's say, Amazon US or AliExpress in China, it has gone through a customs. All right, if you want to learn more about this and practice your Spanish, check this week NTX, where we have a full interview to know more about this. Uh, anything that speeds up customs <laughs> for, oh any, for any reason. I'm into it. I'm into that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you can find that article at dailytechnewsshow.com slash NTX. Let's check out the mailbag. We got a good one from Daniel who wrote us on Patreon uh, saying greetings from Melbourne, Australia. Thanks for the info on password managers. We talked about this with Rod Simmons a couple days ago. Daniel says some notes about my migration from LastPass that could be useful to others. Oh, Some cool. sites won't give you feedback on valid password length, which means you're trialing and resetting passwords until you get one that's valid. Other services put strange or outdated limitations like six characters, alphanumeric passwords. Think about what services you need to access from places that you're not going to be using your password manager before setting up that long password. You don't want to be typing 60 plus characters into your PlayStation, for example. Yeah. Use this as an opportunity to close those unused accounts. Oh, these are good tips. Thank you, Daniel, uh, for sending the email. Keep those emails coming, folks. Feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. Indeed. And thanks to you, Chris Ashley. Um, we always love having you on the show, but let folks know what else you do. Uh, well, you can definitely find me on SMR Podcast. And this week's episode features a touching tribute from Rod Simmons to his <laughs> favorite uh, podcasters. But he does not get to live that uh, touching moment very well. <laughs> very well. I mean, if there was if there was ever a tease, that's it. <laughs> find then, out what Chris and Rob did to Rod Simmons <laughs> on the next SMR podcast. <laughs> uh, and always catch me on Barbecue and Tech. Last week's episode talking about uh, the new uh, butcher block hey, cutting board. I, that's I, my I wasn't board. able to make. That, and I wanted people to understand that that image that is a full cheat pan that is being dwarfed by that cutting board. So that thing is massive. I can't wait to cut my first brisket. But yeah, we talk, we're talking all kinds of barbecue and technology we use around it. Love it. SMRpodcast.com, barbecue and uh, BBQ and tech.com, and Big Chris Ashley on the socials. Thanks to our brand new bosses. Tom, we are <gasps> four for four. What nice. day is it? Thursday? It's Thursday. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. four days. Yeah. Andrew and John just started backing us on Patreon. So thank you, Andrew. Thank you, John. We see you. And yes. we're glad to have you. Today's show is Andrew, John, and every other patron. Uh, <laughs> and Andrew and John, welcome on in. Get that RSS feed because if you stick around for the extended show, Good Day Internet, uh, we're going to talk about two no longer operational third-party Twitter clients that are asking their users not to accept a refund from the Apple Store. Very nicely. You don't have to do it. It's an interesting, it's an interesting maneuver. And we're going to talk about that Brilliant. on Good Day Internet. You can catch this show live Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Eastern, 2100 UTC. Of course, we're on demand, but we'd love to have you join us if you can live. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. And guess what? We're back tomorrow with Allison Sheridan and Len Peralta joining us. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. 
Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this broker. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>